In this video, I'm going to be addressing a few uh, Muslim arguments which were brought to me once when I was, uh, well, just a few weeks back. Anyway, <coughs> let us begin with the uh, first argument that was presented. Jesus being tempted means a denial of his deity. How can Jesus be God if he was tempted? Firstly, he took on human flesh and was tempted in every way like us. And Satan assumed he could tempt Jesus, but Jesus didn't give in to sin. Satan failed at tempting Jesus. There's no denial of his deity whatsoever, and the abuse of James 1.13 is not a refutation of his deity. Sam Shamoon, in his article, A Christian Defense, says, quote, It must be remembered that although Jesus was tempted, he was still without sin. Hebrews 4.15 Furthermore, James's meaning is not that no one can try and tempt God, since many have tried. Deuteronomy 6.16, Malachi 3.15, Matthew 4.7, Acts 15.10. But there is nothing within God that would lead him to act upon temp the temptations. Similarly, although Jesus was tempted, there was nothing within Christ that would cause him to act upon it, since he was perfect God and perfect man." Unquote. So this will deal with the first argument presented by the Muslims. The next argument we have is in connection with 1 John 4.12. Now, no one has seen God at any time. Now this connects him with John 1.18, sorry, John 1.18, where it talks about the only begotten Son, or the only unique Son, as it should say, the monogamous the Ars, the unique God, who is in the bosom of the Father, has exegeted him. Now, both texts do not say that no one has seen God at any time, period. John 1.18 is an expansion on 1 John 4.12 to show that the Son has exegeted the Father. In fact, on my uh, response to Saved by Baptism, I go into more depth with regards to John 5.37, which addresses the subject of no one can, has seen God at any time. Feel free to watch that, and I'll post it in the description below. The next argument brings up the subject of the Holy Spirit being blasphemed and not being forgiven. Yet, the Son and the Father can be forgiven despite being blasphemed. Why is this? Simple. It's the Holy Spirit who gives life. He is the means by which Christians can be empowered to do what the Father requires and turn to Jesus Christ, which no man can do without the Holy Spirit convicting them first and then quickening them. And thus blaspheming the Spirit cuts you off from the only means of accepting Jesus Christ, the means of regenerating you. A very important maxim to note, which James White quotes in his book, The Forgotten Trinity, says, Difference in function does not indicate inferiority of nature. That is a very, very profound phrase. Just because the, the Father, Son, and Spirit take different roles... In man's redemption, this is not a negation of co-equality in their essence. That's just the fact of the matter. One part of a discussion I went on to with regards to the death of Christ was I went to the Talmud and made the point about the death of the righteous making atonement, or mitatan shal sadikim makeparet. It's a well-known discussion in the Talmud. This is what Moed Katan says in 28a. The Talmud asks why the Book of Numbers records the death of Miriam immediately after the section on the red heifer. Sorry. The answer is that just as the red heifer atones, so also the death of the righteous atones. And why the Talmud asks is the death of Aaron recorded in conjunction with the Torah's reference to the priestly garments? The answer is, just as the garments of the high priest atone, so also the death of the righteous atones. Now before I go on, it's very important to note, according to this tradition, the death of a righteous person only atoned for a particular generation. And my argument was, and has often been my argument, and I ask this to Jews who are watching this, if Miriam and Aaron's death can make atonement for their generation, how much more would Jesus, as Messiah and God in the flesh, how, much, how many more generations would his death atone for? Countless, if not infinite. <clears throat> now, one of the Muslims said, well, you're accepting a contradiction, because Isaiah 53, uh, the Talmud says it's about Moses or Jeremiah, and 
you know. That is true, it does mention that, but that's another subject that's neither here nor there, and it was a red herring, because I wasn't even discussing Isaiah 53 at that point in time. But the Talmud speaking about Isaiah 53 is another story. The next question is, the, is who sends the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is both the Father and the Son send the Spirit. John 14:26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Luke 24:49. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. John 1:33. And I myself did not know him. But the one who has sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you will see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John, tw John 2.22 After he ra was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words Jesus had spoken. John 15.26 When the advocate comes, he will, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. John 16.13 But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Acts 1.4 4, 4. Acts 1, 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And there are others, which I could quote, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll just leave it at that, for those verses. The next argument was regards to Jeremiah 31, 30, and Ezekiel 18, 20. Man cannot die for another's sins. Both the passages in question are not addressing vicarious atonement. They are talking about man being responsible to God for their own sins, i.e., I am responsible for my sins, not the sins of my parents but it is not talking about vicarious atonement. Jesus' death, although he dies for my sins, it doesn't discredit the fact that I'm still responsible and answerable to Jesus for the sins that I commit, though he pays for them, and, uh, and by my repentance and faith can be cleansed from them, I'm still held responsible for committing those sins. That's essentially what it is. Another question that's brought to the table is how can Jesus be God if he is accredited by God? But this is not the only thing Peter said. What he says is Jesus is a man accredited by God in Acts 2.22. G Paul is, sorry, Peter is starting with the points of agreement that he and his opponents can agree on, that Jesus is a man, he did mighty miracles. But what the Muslims fail to mention is that not only is Jesus a man, Peter goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 15, that Jesus is the author of life and was killed. No prophet can be called the author of life. And Zuckernike's author of life argument, author of life at that time, or way true for the life at that time, doesn't work. Also, you have references to Jesus being prayed to in the same way that the Old Testament saints called on the name of Yahweh, found in Genesis 4.26. And even Acts 9, Ananias comments on Paul arresting those who call on the name of Jesus. He even says to Jesus, I have seen all the harm that this man has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here to arrest all who call on your name. Calling on Jesus' name means praying to him, singing to him, giving praise and glory to him, which would be idolatry if Jesus was a mere man. Or as Anthony Buzzard puts it, an agent. You know, if you guys are familiar with Anthony Farquhar Buzzard, his argument is often, Jesus can do all this because he's Yahweh's agent. The argument of agency is utterly bogus. <laughs> and of course it's a distortion of um, agency. And there's a recording where Sam Shimon addresses this, which I hope to upload in the future. An additional point, how Jesus is God, and yet be accredited. Was, as I mentioned before, it's Jesus being accredited by the Father. It's the Father anointing the Son. All this is is a, simply an ignorance of the Trinity. Then they bring up Eli, Eli Lama Sabachthani, or My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me? Which is, and Jesus is quoting a messianic psalm. That's what he's quoting, Psalm 22. 
Another question, why is he talking to the Father? It's two gods. Number one, Jesus is not the Father. Number two, it's one God, three persons, not three gods. Three, Jesus as a man relates to the Father as his God. And according to Jeremiah 32, 27, Yahweh is the God of all flesh. So when Jesus, the, the Son, took on human flesh, he began relating to the Father as his God. It's as simple as that, but it's not a denial of his deity. There was another claim where, supposedly, Acts 26, Paul says he is God. But, even just reading it, nowhere is that, nowhere is that even indicated within the context of <clears throat> Acts 26. And I would like that Muslim, if he was watching this, to provide this so-called reference where Paul supposedly is called God, because it's not there. Another commonly abused text is with regards to 2 Peter 1, 3, 4, where it says we all may participate in the divine nature. And this was assumed to mean that all the disciples are God. That's not what it means. What the section in context means, this refers to, it refers to the disciples participating in the love, righteousness, holiness, and the grace of God. But this does not make us God at all doesn't make us God. Anyway, this is quite a mouthful to deal in just uh, under 15 minutes. Anyway, I hope this helped. Thanks for watching.